I'm a child psychologist. Yes, I know I look older. <laughs> it's like a joke. <laughs> Has characteristics similar to a joke. Uh, and I study media's effects on kids. And I think it's fair to ask the question, why would we even worry about that? And I think this sums it up. Congratulations, it's cable ready. I think maybe we should let the television hold him first. Today's kids are growing up in a really different environment than that in which you and I grew up. There are far more types of media than ever before in human history. Children spend far more time with them than ever before in human history. They have far greater access to them than ever before in human history. And I think that alone makes it a fair question. Might it have a different effect than we've ever seen before? So that's what makes it fair to ask about. But when we come to this idea of video game or internet addiction, I have to admit, I started off really skeptical of it. I thought, that can't be right. All that means, when, when, my, when a parent says, my child's addicted to games, all they really must mean is, my kid spends a lot of time playing, and I don't understand why. That's what I figured was really happening here, that it's not an addiction, because to be an addiction, means much more than you do something a lot. It means you do it in a way that damages your functioning. You do it in a way that harms your life. And I thought, that's not what's going on here. In fact, you know, internet and game use is completely normative. If we look you know, across Australia, 91% of Australian teens say the internet's really important to them in their daily lives. Um, we, recent you know, uh, research came out that showed 81% of Australian kids aren't getting enough exercise, largely because they're spending so much time in front of screens. So that means most kids find a lot of value in the screen. So is that an addiction? Well, for some kids, it certainly looks like it can be. And so, Here's one kid who has just been told by his brothers, it's time to turn off the computer and come to dinner. No, 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 no! I don't know what you're trying to do! No! I'm going with, no! I just said what? 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 First, I jumped over my camera, and then I'll freaking beat all you. It, it goes on. So it looks like this kid's having a hard time uh, not playing, but is that really an addiction? How would we define it? Well, there are lots of ways we can define addictions. There is not one, you know universally agreed upon definition, but they all do share a certain important common feature, which is it's about dysfunction. The commonality across all these different ways of defining it is that you have to be damaging your life, and not just one area of life, because that's normal. Anything you love to do, you will damage part of your life for. If you love golfing, you will sometimes skip out of work a little early to go golf. You might refuse to do something with your spouse on a weekend because you'd rather go golfing. You know, that's actually very normal, that when you love something, you will give up, sacrifice other parts of your life for it. So it can't just be one or two things. You have to be damaging multiple areas of your life all at once, your social functioning, your occupational functioning, your school functioning, your family functioning, your psychological functioning, your emotional functioning. Only when it reaches that level does it count as an addiction. And I thought, if we study it that clinical way, no kid's going to have this problem. It turns out I was wrong. A lot of kids do. Now, the way I've uh, studied it is trying to say, well, if it's like other addictions, it should look like other addictions. You should be able to measure it reliably. You should be able to show that uh, you get a, you know, a, a very typical and predictable pattern uh, that where the addicted kids uh, should be playing more, they should uh, feel addicted, they should, uh, just like other addictions, if you're substance addiction, you tend to be more likely to be male, to be hostile in your personality, to exhibit more antisocial behaviors, more aggressive behaviors, uh, you get worse grades, well, we should see that same pattern with gaming if it's a problem. 
But beyond that, we should be able to predict some new things. Uh, in the substance addiction literature, for example, there's a phenomenon called Q reactivity. And the idea is that if you're addicted to something, you become highly emotionally reactive to the cues associated with your addiction. So if you're alcohol addicted and I show you a shot glass with no alcohol, just the shot glass itself, you will actually get a big emotional reaction to it and, and report feelings of craving, even though there is no alcohol present. Or if you're heroin addicted and I show you a hypodermic needle, you will have a huge emotional reaction to it. So we become reactive to the cues that go along with our addiction. So we might see something like that. We also might be able to predict certain types of outcomes, that if kids become addicted to games, that you would see certain things being uh, predictable outcomes, such as poor school performance, or maybe depression, or things like that. Uh, we might be able to show that there are certain types of risk factors that predict who gets addicted. And these should all look like other addictions if it really is an addiction. Well, uh, I've done several studies now, starting in 1999. I'm not going to tell you all of them, but I'm going to pull out a few highlights. Uh, with the, this is with the 608th and 9th graders. We found that the kids who would classify as pathological, who are you know, damaging at least five areas of their life, uh, compared to other gamers, uh, their parents notice it. 60% of them say they play too much. Uh, they actually say they do it to try to release their anger. They prefer more violence in games, which is similar to uh, tolerance, you know, that as you gain more, it gets boring and you need more and more. It's very similar to a drug tolerance pathway there. Um, and they're more likely to say that they have felt addicted, but notice it's only about half of them. So half of them are addicted, but still don't think they are, and that's very similar to other addictions too. Oh, I can quit at any time. Um, and we found this other pattern that the kids who would classify also were higher in hostility, higher antisocial behaviors, higher aggressive behaviors, more likely to be male, poor school performance, almost exactly the pattern that you would see with a substance addiction. We then conducted a large national sample with Harris Polls, a great polling organization in the US, and we got this huge representative sample all across the US of eight to 18 year olds. We found that nine out of 10 kids play games. That's been found in other studies. We find that the average amount of time is about 13 hours a week uh, in the US. Um, when we ask the kids, do your parents have any rules for your use, uh, only half the kids say that their family has any rules at all. And when we look at the types of games they're playing, 22% uh, of you know, elementary school children are playing what would be here an R-rated game. And they own these. It's not just they play them. They own them in their houses. 40% of 12 to 14-year-olds are playing uh, the mature games, and over half of 15 through 18-year-olds are playing them. When we look across all the kids, though, we find that 8.5% of them would classify as addicted by this clinical definition. And we found, again, the same type of pattern, that they are spending more time playing, they are getting worse grades, they're more likely to have been uh, diagnosed with an attention deficit problem, they're more likely to have game systems in their bedrooms, they're more likely to say they feel addicted. Now is 8.5% a big number or a small number? In one sense it's good news, right? 92% of gamers aren't having a problem. That's good. So, but if 8% are, how many kids is that? Well, in the US there are 40 million children between 8 and 18, if nine out of 10 of them play games and eight and a half percent of them are addicted, that's over three million children today are taking serious damage to their lives because of the way they're gaming. And they're not getting help because no one thinks this is really a real problem yet. Now, how do you know if your research is having an impact on the world? Well, when it gets picked on by late night comedy shows, Jimmy Fallon, this new study shows about one out of every 10 kids who plays video games is addicted. You know what those kids really need is rehab. That rehab's such an awesome game. It's on Xbox and PlayStation. I played it for six hours yesterday. Now, when we look across countries, this 8% number seems to be somewhere in the middle of what most countries are starting to find. In the US, uh, other studies are finding a similar number. It's 8% in Australia, 11% uh, in Germany, 8.5% in Singapore, 10% in mainland China, 7.5% in Taiwan. 
there are some studies that show lower, there's some that show higher, but really it looks like they're all starting to coalesce somewhere in here between, uh, you know, seven and 10 percent. And if we look across several different studies, we are finding this pattern that looks like other addictions. Now, this leaves some really important questions unanswered, though. For example, is it really a primary problem? Is it something that, uh, or is it just a symptom of other problems? You know, kids who get worse grades and are more aggressive, maybe they don't have friends, so they game because they don't have anything else to do. So really, the gaming's not a problem. So to answer some of these questions, we need to approach it some new ways. And so in one study, I had kids, college age kids, coming in and playing three different video games. And we had them doing this to actually help set up a different study. But as part of it, we asked them to rate the games on several dimensions and also tell us how they felt after playing each game for 20 minutes. And I'd given them another survey asking them about their normal gaming habits. And I had, in, as part of that, found out whether or not they would classify as addicted gamers. And I realized that maybe the addicted gamers would have a really different reaction to playing a game for 15 or 20 minutes. Just like an alcohol addicted person would have a really different you know, uh, reaction to a highball glass than a non-addicted person, maybe they would have bigger emotional reaction when they played the game. And they might rate the game at least on the subjective dimensions, as very different. You know, they might think it's way more fun and more exciting to play than a normal gamer. But on the objective dimensions, like how violent it is or how action-packed it is, they should rate those the same. Now, when I'm talking about key reactivity, what do I mean here? Well, let me show you a little pseudo-experiment we did on the Jane Pauley show. Did you know what effect the playing game, games had on you physically? Were you aware of that? I was very surprised. I, I didn't expect my blood pressure to go up and mm -hmm. my heart rate to go up. And yeah, I, I am surprised. I you mean, know, I was surprised too. I want to I want to show everybody there is a way to measure the physiological impact that video games have on a player like Kenneth. Let's see. The game we have for uh, Kenneth today is a fighting game, and we've shown in past research that the violent video games tend to cause a little bit of, more of an increase in physiological arousal, like blood pressure and also hormones in your body, like adrenaline. We're going to monitor Kenneth with a uh, portable heart rate, blood pressure, um, an EKG monitor. Kenneth's um, blood pressure is very normal for a man his age, 22-year-old male. He's gone up to 140 over 69 just as we're about to start playing the game. So Kenneth's getting excited, anticipating um, playing. And it's actually the anticipation of the event that causes more physiological arousal sometimes than the actual event. At this point, Kenneth's heart rate started about 85 beats per minute. Once he's about three minutes in, we're at the three to five minute mark right now, his heart rate's already gone up to 120 beats per minute. It's about a 40% or so increase in uh, heart rate. Even though heart rate and blood pressure may go up at you, like you might see with exercise, it's different from exercise. This would be considered a behavioral stressor. This is at the 20 minute mark now. At this point, you can see his blood pressure has gone up to 155 over 77, which would be considered hypertension. One thing we see with people who are addicted is that over time, they need to play more and more in order to achieve the same amount of arousal. So Kenneth's been playing about 30 minutes at this point, and his blood pressure during the last round maxed out at 190 over 144. Now, that's significant hypertension. I would be a little concerned having physiological arousal as significant as what we saw with Kenneth today. And did you feel any sense of that? Yeah, it was getting pretty tensed. Yeah. Intense. Did you win or lose? I won some, I lost some. It's a one by one basis thing. Do you think the losing is when it kind of spikes up to the, Sometimes. the scary level? I mean, it's more like when you're about to lose or about to win, and then you actually win or you actually lose, and it's like, you know. We found that those who would classify as addicted showed a really interesting pattern of uh, emotional reactions. They were less calm and peaceful and pleasant than the other gamers. They were less agitated or irritated. They were more angry or both more or less mad. They were both more or less happy. They were more energetic, less lonely, sad, and unhappy. That's really kind of a confusing list, isn't it? 
I think there are two things that are interesting about that list. The first one is that it's truth. If you're addicted to something, you have complicated emotions about it. You love your alcohol and you hate it because it controls you. Uh, so I think the fact that this is not just one singular approach is accurate. That's the way addictions really are. You get to have complicated relationship with uh, whatever it is you're addicted to. And the second thing is, it does show that the addicted gamers did have a much bigger emotional reaction. Uh, it might be in this direction for one kid and that direction for another kid, but in both cases, it was a substantially larger reaction. So they do seem to be showing this Q reactivity. When we look at how they rate the games, so not about their reaction, on the subject of dimensions, the addicted gamers uh, did say that they were more entertaining, exciting, fun, absorbing, arousing, enjoyable, involving, stimulating, and addicting, and less likely to call them boring. So they did have a bigger reaction to them that way. But on the object of dimensions, they were equally likely as the other gamers to call them action-packed or violent or difficult to play. So it's starting to look like other addictions. But what comes first? Is it that maybe kids uh, who are less socially competent, don't have as many friends, aren't doing as well in school, they get depressed? And so then they go home and they play games to feel better. Well, does the gaming help their school performance? No. Does it help their social competence? No. So then they get more depressed, and so they game more. So maybe the gaming is just a symptom of the depression. That's what I expected to find. Again, I was wrong. We studied 3,000 Singaporean children. We followed them for three years. They started in grades three, four, seven, eight. And if we look at their uh, addiction symptoms, five symptoms is where you, that's the cutoff for where you would call someone addicted. So some of those kids started above five, but ended at two years later, they stopped being addicted. Good, good for them. Some of the kids started under that line, but they became addicted over the time. Some of them stayed addicted for the whole two years. And the majority of kids, you know, they might pick up one or two or lose one or two symptoms, but they never crossed that line. So they never were addicted in the two years that we followed them. So this gives us four interesting groups we can look at. That uh, these two groups started off both being addicted, but these ones stopped. You know, what's it, what? What's changed at the end for the ones who stopped? Maybe that tells us something about you know, the outcomes. Or these ones both uh, started under being addicted, but these group became addicted. Well, what's the risk factor? Maybe we can predict why these ones became addicted, and then we can also see what the outcome is. To make the long story short, here's basically what we found, that at the beginning of the study, there were certain risk factors. Kids who were more impulsive, who had lower social competence, and who were spending more time playing, they ended up gaining in addiction symptoms across the two years. And as they gained in symptoms, their depression got worse, their anxiety got worse, their social phobias got worse, and their grades got worse. If, however, they stopped being addicted, we saw the opposite pattern. Their depression lifted, their anxiety lifted, their social phobia lifted. So it looks like the gaming actually is the primary problem. It's causing these other mental health issues. Now, I actually don't think that's the correct interpretation. I think the correct interpretation is it's truly comorbid. That if you only went in and treated the gaming, well, the kid's also depressed. You're not gonna, the kid's not gonna get entirely better. But if you only went in and trained, treated the depression without the gaming, you're also going to miss the point too. We need to treat the entire pattern because they're ending up pushing each other around and that's typical of most mental health disorders. They become comorbid and make each other worse. Now, what about how much time they're playing? Is gaming more than just the amount of time they play? <clears throat> we know that, we saw that you know, if they're addicted, their grades go down. But we also know from several other studies that the more time kids play, the worse their grades get. So maybe it really is just about time. And if it is, then it's not really an addiction. So we controlled for the amount of time that kids played, but we found that if they would classify as addicted, that still helped predict their school performance. So it's not just about the amount of time, it is something more than just playing a lot. Is it a long problem or a short problem? Maybe yes, today there are eight and a half percent of kids who would classify as addicted, but next week 
it would be a different 8.5% because maybe this week I get a new game, I'm really excited, and I let my grade slide. But after a week or two, once I'm done with that game, I've beaten it, then I, come, I rebound back to normal. Well, in our study of 3,000 kids, of the kids who were addicted at the beginning of the study, 84% still were two years later. It's not something that most of them could get out of. Once they were addicted, they stayed addicted. 80, only 16% across two years were able to stop being addicted. <clears throat> so my overall summary is sometimes I get asked about, well, are game, is gaming addiction different from internet addiction or Facebook addiction or mobile addiction? Um, I think the correct analog here is pathological gambling. People who gamble on horses don't play roulette. And people who gamble on roulette don't gamble on poker. And people who gamble on poker don't play the slot machine. So are those four different addictions? Is that horse addiction and slot machine addiction and, and roulette addiction? No. Those are all the same things because we would diagnose them the same way. And we would probably treat them about the same way. I think that's the same thing we're going to find with different technologies, is that although they look different, the way they manifest the behavior is a little different, but the underlying problem is the same thing. And we would need to treat them basically the same way, whether we're talking about computer or internet. Now, I think if we're talking about internet gambling or internet pornography, then those are different. Because if you just treat the internet, you're missing, you know, that's a gambling problem. That's a sex problem. Now, people often ask, well, are some games more addictive than others? I have a hard time thinking about that, because I don't think games are like a substance. It's not like crack cocaine is more addictive than snorted cocaine, because that's something about our physiological response to those different chemicals. Games aren't like that. They aren't a substance. So I, I don't really think it's really about the games. I think it's about the gamer. And I think the problem is this is an impulse control disorder that you know you should do your homework, but you just can't stop playing. You know you should go to sleep, but you just need one more level. And that what we would need to do is teach kids to recognize the impulse and decide whether this is an appropriate time to act on it or not. But if the homework's not done, well, then you can't act on that impulse yet. Nonetheless, there are some studies showing that certain game features do make some games a little more risky. Uh, particularly the ones that are internet connected, like World of Warcraft, which you can play with 11 million of your closest friends. One way to think about this is to think about what motivates people. When we're talking about human motivation, there's an ABC of human motivation. The A is autonomy. We want to feel like we're good at things. And we want to, or I'm sorry, we want to feel like we're in control. The B is belongingness, or in the proper term, it's relatedness. We want to feel like we connect to other people. And the C is competence. That's where we want to feel like we're good at things. Uh, think about a video game. Games are fantastic. You're holding a controller, so you're in control. They t start at a low level and train you how to play it, so you get competent. And if you're playing online, or if you're playing in the same room with friends, or if you go to school and talk about the game, you're actually getting your relatedness needs met through it, too. And so games are fantastic. And the, more, the better a game is at meeting these three needs, the higher risk it probably is that then that child will start putting more of their time into that and not getting those needs met in other areas of their life. If we compare this, say, to like you know the classroom, are the kids in control? No, they get told what to do. Uh, you know, do the kids feel competent? No, because a good teacher actually keeps you right at that edge of your learning something new, right? Um, and then do they feel related? No, they're not allowed to talk to the other kids. And if they do talk, they just talk about how much they hate this class. Uh, so these, when, when these three needs are met, you love it. If your job gives you these three things, you love your job. And if your job doesn't, you hate your job. And this is what makes for a lot of human motivation. Now, the good news is, well, you know, we can build whole economies based off of uh, video game addicts. But if you noticed you had a problem, would you go get help? Well, we've done some other studies that show that the more people watch television and movies that show psychologists in them, the less willing they are to go get help. <laughs> so we're really shooting ourselves in the foot here. <clears throat> What's newest on this? There's a new paper about to come out in the journal Addiction um, that is 
describing an international consensus on how we should diagnose it. This uh, international consensus is also represented by Australia, Philip Tam, who's here in Sydney and is your country's top uh, therapist working with video game and internet addicts. And the American Psychological Association in its update of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, which is the Bible for how we diagnose mental health disorders, has included for the first time internet gaming disorder. So it is a real problem now. It can be diagnosed. Now it's in the appendix because that's where they put new things that the evidence shows. It looks like it's real, but we still need more data about it. And how you would diagnose it are these nine issues. And you ask about in the past 12 months, are these ones true for you? Do you spend a lot of time thinking about games even when you're not playing? So that shows that it's mentally, cognitively salient and disrupting other things. Do you feel restless or irritable when you're trying to stop? So that shows withdrawal symptoms. Do you need to play for more and more time to get the same amount of excitement? So that shows tolerance, just like in other drugs. Do you feel you should play less, but you can't stop? So that shows a, a lack of control. You've lost control of it. Do you lose interest in or reduce participation in other things you used to like doing? So you're now starting to harm other areas of your life to game. Do you keep playing games even though you're aware of problems like your school grade suffering? So there you're con continuing despite the warning signs. Do you lie to your family or friends or try to cover it up? So now you're harming your social and family relationships. You're harming those trust relationships. Uh, do you game to escape from or forget personal problems? So this is a low level distraction technique. The problem's still there once you're done gaming, but you're, so you're actually just you're not helping it, and you may be making it worse by not really trying to address it. And do you risk or lose significant relationships, jobs, or educational opportunities because of your gaming? So if you can answer yes to five of these, you win. You're in the club. Now, there are still things to be studied. We're not really sure we know what all the risk factors are. We know some of them. Uh, we have almost no evidence of good protective factors, unfortunately, from the studies that have been done. We don't know if there's a clear pattern that kids always follow this pattern as they become addicted. Uh, we don't know how long it lasts. The longest study, you know, two years, they're still addicted to two years. We don't know how long it would go on. We haven't done longer longitudinal studies. And we don't really know what type of treatment is the most effective, although several types are being used, and many of them are showing some promising results. But does this mean we shouldn't be taking action? No, we should be taking action right now because millions of people are already suffering. They're already taking damage to multiple areas of their life and should be getting help. But they're not going to get that help because we still aren't really asking about it. But the odds that more people are going to have problems with this are just going up because one of the things we know from the substance and gambling addiction literatures is the number one predictor of whether you get addicted is if you have access. If you don't have drugs in your community, you can't get addicted to them. We've now put computers in the classroom. We've now put them in the bedroom. We've now, you know, my, even my younger daughter, you know, has, has a little one she sticks in her pocket, right? They're, we've given 24-hour access. The odds are just going to go up that kids are going to have problems with them. And as the technologies get better and more immersive and more exciting, the odds go up even still. So what should we be doing? Well, I think we need comprehensive media literacy curricula in the schools. Um, and I, what do I mean by comprehensive media literacy? I don't just mean that we teach kids how to read symbols, how to use computers, and, uh, and perhaps even how to create media. I mean that we talk about the science on it, like what does the research really show about media violence? What does it really show about how advertising uh, damages your self-image uh, and makes you think you should buy more things and just be a consumer? Uh, what does it show about uh, how uh, the media influence body image and eating disorders? Uh, what does it show about addiction? I mean, if we tell kids the truth about this, they become a partner in their health. They don't want to be harmed by it either. But as long as we continue to think that it's, oh, it's just entertainment, it just has no important effects, well then, we're not trying to shield ourselves from the harmful effects, and we're also not getting the maximum benefits that we could be. I think we also need to change the culture around media where we start talking about it more. 
Um, it's a funny thing to say, we should talk more about the media, but here's what I mean. At my university, we have a lot of first year freshmen flunk out of college. For the first time, they are given total control over their time, total control of their schedule, uh, and they're given 24-hour broadband internet access in the dorms, where they hang out with a bunch of other young men who also like to play games. So they spend all night playing games, and then they don't go to class, and then they don't get good grades. If they bother to go down to the student counseling service, which is free, so there's no reason they can't go down there, if they bother to, they walk in and they say, my grades are bad. I'm upset because my grades are bad. What does the therapist hear? Well, she hears that the kid's upset about grades. So she asks questions that are relevant to that, right? About study habits and about note taking and about going to class and maybe about sleep. She doesn't ask about gaming. Why not? He didn't present with a problem of gaming. He didn't say his gaming was a problem, so why would you ask about it? Why doesn't he talk about that? Well, because from his point of view, the gaming is the solution. He feels bad about his grades, so he comes home and he games to feel better. So no one talks about this giant elephant in the room that is really part of the problem, and so the problem doesn't get solved. Now, because access matters, limiting access then matter, matters, and parents can be a real powerful ally in this, uh, this way. We just put out new study of 1,300 families. I talked to these kids, I talked to their parents, I talked to their teachers, I talked to the school nurses. And we looked at how much the parents just naturally, right, what wasn't an intervention, we weren't telling, teaching them how to monitor their children's media use. And we just found out how much parents set limits on the amount of time their kids can play video games and watch television, and we checked how much they have limits on what the content is, whether they, whether they set any limits at all. And this has a couple immediate effects that the parents might notice. That those kids then are spending less time with media and they're consuming less media violence. That makes perfect sense, right? We followed these kids up again at the end of the school year, seven months later, and we found a wide range, this huge ripple effect from that early parental monitoring that parents will never notice. Those kids whose parents were setting more limits on the amount and content of media, they were getting better sleep by the end of the school year. They had lower weight gain, so the risk of obesity was decreased. They were getting better grades in school. They were having more pro-social, helpful, cooperative behaviors and fewer aggressive behaviors, as noted by the teachers, by the way, which is remarkable because the teachers don't know what's happening at home, but they can see the effects in the behavior. But no one will put all these dots together. The parent will never notice these, this wide range of effects because you're, you're never going to notice that your child is getting better grades than he otherwise would have. You're never going to notice that your kid is more pro-social than he was going to be. You're never going to notice they gained less weight than he otherwise would have. You, you won't ever see these effects. And these are a wide range of effects. That's physical health and school performance and social well-being. Those aren't even the same type of variables. And yet this ripple from the simple task of having parents set limits on the amount and content of media goes out across all of these health and wellness outcomes, but parents will never know they're having that effect because you can't see it from the inside. So it's important that we let parents recognize just how powerful a position they're in because they often feel like they have no power, but it's totally not true. So school counselors have an important role to play here, partly because you're one of the first people to see the problems. You and the teachers, you see the problems. Unfortunately, the teachers get blamed for them. Uh, the parents come in and yell, about the, you know, yell at the teacher, but the teacher's not given much control over the situation. So the counselor can help you know, uh, being the person connecting all these dots making sure that the parents understand they have an important role to play too. And if the problem starts looking serious, the school counselor can help uh, get the children perhaps into the types of therapy they need. They also are able to you know, understand both sides' perspective and understand the technical science and help translate that for all the parties. 
There are several tools that are available for counselors. The international checklist that you know, I gave you in, in your handout there, you can use that. It's a good starting place. It's not really a true clinical tool. You wouldn't want to diagnose just with that. But if kids are having a lot of symptoms, then you, they would probably need the full clinical interview to find out just how serious a problem it is. Uh, there's also uh, a tool by Philip Tam called the Improve Tool, which he has out on his website. And that's available for people there. And thank you. Good luck for doing all the work you're doing.